Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, welcome back to PFAS GS Access Day. Uh, the last session of today's event is called Access Via Translation. Before we get started, let me introduce myself first. My name is Chen Chen. I am the current lead of PFAS GS project. I am a Chinese person with black short hair wearing a black shirt sitting in front of a white wall. Uh, uh, just a reminder that you can turn on the CC Lab transcription feature on the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, the last session of today's event is called Access Via Translation, moderated by Kenneth Lim. The speakers from this session are joining from four different time zones. So thank you so much for getting up so early and staying up so late. In this session, panelists Kenneth, Ingwa, Shahaya and Felipe will share their experience translating PFAGES website and documentation to simplified Chinese, Korean, Hindi, and Portuguese. And then we'll discuss the impact and the future plan of translation for PFAGES. Let me start the session by introducing the moderator. Kenneth Lim is an interaction designer and a creative coder working with text and language. Kenneth is a contributor of the Simplified Chinese translation of PFAS website and documentation. Kenneth, please take over from here. Hey, thanks very much, Q. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm Kenneth. I'm Kenneth Lim. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and uh, I'm a person of uh, East Asian descent. And currently, I'm wearing a uh, black t shirt and I'm wearing glasses. So to start with, let me share my screen and I'll just give a bit of a introduction to my work and uh, some of the things that I'm thinking about uh, currently. So hopefully you all can see my screen now. So again, that's my uh, name, Kenneth Lim. So uh, on the slides here is uh, basically just black text on white background and most of the slide will be this way and I'll describe them as I go. Uh, my name is Kenneth Lim again, and online you would know me as uh, Limzy Kenneth. If you ever hung around on GitHub, you might see me as uh, Limzy Kenneth on GitHub as well. So I've um, kind of came into P5.js uh, quite a while ago, around 2015, 2016. Um, and one thing led to the other. Eventually, I was uh, doing the translation for PFIGS from English into Chinese as part of the processing uh, fellowship. And that project really just kickstarted everything that is to come about um, translation for me, and also about how I think about translation when it comes to the technology um, and software sector. So as you see on the screen here is a screenshot of the uh, PFIJS GitHub page. And this particular page here, um, there's not much that I would have to say here, um, mainly because uh, the maintenance of PFIJS is kind of not uh, the topic here. But I just want to kind of just give you a look into what people will see when they first land onto the GitHub uh, page for P5.js. And if you're not familiar with GitHub at all, you're not a technically minded person, you might not know where to start. And I'm sure even for myself, when I first uh, stumble upon GitHub, I don't know where to start. And imagine you're a translator who are just starting to use P5.js, you want to contribute translation and you're faced with this problem. So I want to basically frame the, this, this particular um, talk, I guess, in a few ways uh, by just asking a few questions. I want to start with just the very general question about why translate? Why is translating uh, P5.js important? Why is translating software important? And there's a few, there's many different reasons, there's different reasons from different people. I'll be talking mainly based on my own experience and my own research. And at the same time, I don't claim to represent a comprehensive viewpoint. I'm sure the other speakers will present a uh, very good viewpoints of their own as well. But I just want to share one that uh, I have. So one of the main things that drives me towards translating software and technology 
is that I don't think English should be a prerequisite for learning and using technology. You shouldn't need to know English to be able to code. You shouldn't need to know English to be able to use a particular software to create um, any piece of creative artwork or uh, anything that's related to technology. And at the same time, I also don't think that technological innovation should happen only in English. And it isn't only happening in English. It isn't happening in only English and it shouldn't happen in English. And translation is a way for us to be able to start to reconcile this, um, this, this gap between the English technology world and those that exist in other languages in other cultures as well. So, but there's a problem that we face, which is that translating software and in particular software documentation is difficult. It's, it's a difficult problem. And there is a few different, uh, let's break down this particular problem. So the first thing is translation itself as an act is difficult. The, one of the reasons is that first, there isn't always a simple one-to-one -one relationship between your source text and your origin and your target translation text. Something that can be expressed in one language uh, succinctly, very shortly, we need a lot of we need a lot of description in another language potentially. So that is the first challenge. Another challenge is that. What makes sense in one language doesn't necessarily make sense in another. For example, in one language, you could use uh, specific metaphors, turn of phrase, puns, and these things are notoriously difficult to translate into another language. But well, one saving grace for say uh, software documentation is that there usually contains much less metaphors, turn of phrase, and puns and things like that. But it more than makes up for it with jargon. So there's a lot of jargons in software documentation. There's a lot of things that is coined and only used for that meaning in the software and technology sector, but have completely different meanings elsewhere. And that makes the translation job particularly difficult in this case as well. And on to the next point, which is that documentation is difficult. Documentation itself is difficult. Often a lot of things can go undocumented and often the documentation can be inaccurate or outdated because if you can imagine a scenario where a developer is kind of working on their code and they're just focused and engrossed in it and documentation is kind of thought of as something that came after, it could often be kind of left out um, either by mistake or just intentionally. Um, and that could be a problem because if you don't have good documentation, it becomes very hard for people to um, use your software. And worst of all, there could be no documentation at all, right? Especially for smaller uh, projects, it could be the case that it might, uh, the original author might have created it as a one-off thing that they wanted to use to solve a particular problem. But, and they didn't bother to kind of document it at all. And five years down the line, someone came across it, find it useful, but have no way to begin because again, there's no documentation. They have to go into the source code to figure things out. So documentation is also another difficult problem. And another problem that we have with software documentation uh, translation is maintenance is again difficult. It's very hard to maintain a particular translation to be of the same quality as let's call the original version. And this is one of the part I want to focus a bit more on because this is uh, part of my research uh, where I looked into different toolings, different workflow and different things that could help with this particular aspect of translation. We could have a uh, translate, perfectly translated documentation. But as we mentioned before, 
documentation itself is difficult. And one of the reasons it's difficult is because software change and as software change, obviously the documentation may change with it. And now when we introduce uh, translation, we introduce another thing that needs to keep track of uh, alongside that change. And so this becomes a difficult problem. And as part of my uh, research here at uh, University of uh, University of the Arts London Creative Computing Institute, um, I looked into what can we do about it. So one of the one of the things I look into is uh, Mozilla Pontoon, which is a translation um, a translation management software of my translation management framework. It basically presents you with an interface to be able to translate the uh, a, a particular list of source text into a translated text into a target language. And I did this uh, particular particular uh, test with P5JS, P5JS documentation translation. And uh, with us today, uh, Philippe and Inwa has uh, kind of graciously kind of provided their time to kind of participate in that particular research and the findings from what we did there is that it the overall experience is a positive right we are able to utilize it to be able to um to track our progress of our translation and to a certain extent see that oh uh this particular string is translated in this particular way and maybe we just keep that consistency or that we can even reference uh, different languages how they deal with specific terms and we can maybe can try and learn from how they do their particular translation to feed into our own and while all these two um, kind of often greatly help with the job of translation we can still need people as part of the loop we still need to have translators we still need to have editors to be there to actually look at the particular translation and make sure that okay it's uh, makes sense it's of good quality it's up to date and so on and so forth and um, what i want to stress here is kind of these people these people that came in to translate these people that come in to um, kind of uh, proofread so to speak can be expert in p5js but they definitely can and should be beginners to coding because the documentation itself especially the documentation of p5js itself is very much created for them for the beginners for the new coders for the people who are starting to learn coding and may not know that much and if the way that we document something isn't uh, isn't clear to them then that that is clear sign that we should change the documentation and it also feeds into translation as well if the way we translate a particular piece of uh, documented feature is uh, confusing to them or is something that they are not used to through some other say uh, some other means they got their information from that it is also on us to um, think about okay can we reword this particular translation in another way so that it create less confusion for these people who are going to use the translation and we need we need their help we need their feedback we need the perspective of all of the people who uses p5js who uh, that who doesn't necessarily use english as their modes of learning programming and that is one of the things that I think is very important to, for the project going forward. So in summary, uh, what's next? What is, what is the possible next step that we can take? So in an ideal scenario, it should be a relatively easy thing for a open source software project to have its own documentation translated. There should be too much extra effort that is required of uh, any of its contributors. But in reality, there simply isn't enough resources and toolings to not just translate the documentation and other things, but crucially to maintain this translation. Because one of the things that, um, that should happen to a translation is that 
it fell so far behind the so-called original version that people will point to the translation and say, oh, if you want a proper version of the documentation, you should look at the English version and not the whatever language version that you are looking at. And I think that goes a long way into kind of encouraging people to kind of change this mindset of having to learn English alongside programming um, to be able to learn programming itself. And in terms of solution, well, I have no solution that I can immediately point to, which is where I need all your help for, right? But I do know that we need more translation and we definitely need more uh, maintenance of translations. It's still an open question at this point about how we go about all of this, but I think it's a very much worth exploring point and uh, Hopefully for the rest of the panel, we'll be able to start um, unpacking this particular problem and kind of see what we can do next. So that is it for my presentation. So thanks everyone uh, kind of for this quick overview about uh, what I do here. So let me stop the screen share here. Okay, so let me introduce uh, our panelists. So let's start with our first speaker for today, which will be uh, Inhua. And Inhua is a media artist and XR researcher at Seoul uh, National University Hospital. She creates XR-based interactive system for people with less familiarity or accessibility to medical, creative, and learning experiences in 3D environments. She's been engaging in P5 community as a contributor to the internationalization of P5.js and P5.js editors friendly error system, as well as P5 for 50 plus and P5 for 50 plus teaching projects. So, um, Inhua, do take over. All right, thank you, Kenneth. Let me just share my screen. I hope I'm being audible and my screen is being shared well. Yeah, I guess I am, right, cool. So hi everyone, I'm in Yam. very glad to be a part of P5JS Access Day today. For this Access via translation session, I'll be sharing my experiences with the case of P5JS.org slash KO, that's the official website of P5JS translated in Korean. Um, right now I am wearing a black t-shirt and a gray cardigan on, and I, and I have reddish brown hair that reaches about my breast line. And I recently cut my bang for some sort of seasonal greeting. Yeah, and I, for my virtual background on Zoom, I have the P5JS Access Day poster. Um, I've been engaging with the P5JS community as a designer and developer, translator, and teacher. So my interest in translating p5js.org started back in 2019 when Lauren Lee McCarthy, the creator of p5js, visited South Korea to hold a p5js workshop as a part of her Smarter Home project. On the left side of the slide shows a picture of workshop participants. The participants were mostly uh, non-English speakers and a part of them were older adults. And for the workshop, Lauren had the P5JS website partially translated with the help of Yeser Song, a South Korean media artist, and a screenshot of preliminary translation of P5JS.org by Yeser is on the right side of the slide. Now, being an assistant and interpreter at Lauren's workshop, I had this opportunity to start thinking about what Lauren would have thought of throughout the workshop. That is, um, as it reads on the slide, how to include non English speaking people and uh, non-English speaking and older people on P5JS and the website. So to match with this question, I added as the background image of the slide, a picture of a participant using P5JS web editor to create an ellipse on a gray canvas during the Smarter Home workshop. Um, and this question that reads on the slide is about including Korean speaking population, um, including those who are older adults. Although in South Korea, we nowadays have a diverse scopes and levels of English education and programming, graphic designs, um, still the public or private institutions do not cover 
deliver them at low cost. And especially the computer education at public realm started around the late 1970s in Korea and was democratized since the late 1990s, which means that those who were born before and around mid 1950s didn't have an, an access to public computer education. So there are always like a multiple barriers for non-English speaking people in learning P5JS and that you need a certain level of English and programming and graphics. And needless to say, it becomes even harder for uh, those who are non-English speaking and older. So this question has led me to this project called uh, P5 for 50 plus, which was supported by Processing Foundation Fellowship Program in 2020 with my friend Song Yun Kim. We were mentored by Chin Chin Ye and advised by Lauren. The main goal of this project was to have more language groups such as Korean speaking users, as well as age groups such as those who are older than the age 50 to meet with P5JS in a lingually accessible manner. Hence for this uh, P5 for 50 plus project, translating the entire P5JS.org rendered as a primary goal as I noticed how the website itself could function as a primary and most accessible platform for getting to know what P5JS. Uh, but translating the website in Korean wasn't exactly an easy task. It got me uh, face a lot of following questions and challenges as they read from the slide. So for instance, I had to consider the differing levels of digital literacy, the level of English and familiarity with programming and graphic jargons and their field usage, of course, all of which directly influenced the tone and methods of translation itself. So to enhance the, uh, the feasibility of translation and also for the purpose of the website, I had to assume that the most frequent users of the website would be those who have a basic level of understanding English, um, computer programming and graphics, and those who are willing to further engage with P5JS in community via this website. But this also means that the current version of the translation still has a lot of room for including more interest groups from far more diverse backgrounds. So despite all these challenges, p5js.org slash KO could successfully launch on August 2020 with the help of a lot of people from the Processing Foundation. On the slide shows a screenshot of p5js.org slash KO with this celebratory background sketch created by my fellow Song Yun Kim. Uh, that has laid out Korean alphabets in grayscale with some interactions. Uh, so to encapsulate the overall process of the translation would be something like this. At first, I aim to translate as many pages as possible as understanding the structure and contents of every single web page was necessary during which I learned a lot about P5JS myself. And this process also helped me later in teaching P5JS. Then it was followed by the preliminary translation using some mechanical translators such as the Google translator. And yet I put the most, uh, most effort and time into revising and reviewing the grammar, jargon, the tone and manners of sentences since Korean as a written language could be as picky. It could be really picky as much as it could be flexible. So yeah, after launching the p5js.org in Korean, I thought it was also crucial to make sure that the Korean website is understandable and usable for p5js users, learners, and teachers. Um, it was also imp important for me to provide enough documentation for future translation contributors and be open to discourses as Kenneth has mentioned during his presentation. So for evaluating the p5js.org slash KO, I had a chance to either lead or be invited as a lecturer at a dozen of p5js workshops for beginners, which included Korean older adults and kids as their main participants. And I found that p5js.org slash KO itself really helpful, both in terms of making my own learning materials or using the website itself as a learning material for the participants. And I cannot miss to say that I was really happy to be able to share the contents in Korean. I always introduce p5js.org slash KO as a textbook that people can always refer to anytime, any, anywhere they want, as long as they have, they have their own smartphones. Because in Korea, uh, we have about 95% of people using smartphones here. And the participants so far, so far demonstrated pretty much a uh, higher level of satisfaction with learning P5JS with this website in Korean. But that I guess is probably because the people at the workshop learned P5JS and its relevant jargons via what I had to translate. So I still doubt uh, how other Korean speaking users were familiar with 
uh, programming and graphics would think about the quality of translation. And so for that uh, future evaluation and updating, as well as to enhance the understanding of the Korean speaking users, I thought it was important to integrate the usage of programming and graphic jargon, uh, which were summed up as a glossary spreadsheet. I think I can share this link on the chat after this presentation. Now this glossary was inspired by Kenneth Hears, um, Chinese version of it. This glossary itself is open to change, of course. Uh, likewise, what's most important is to keep the p5js.org slash ko open to any types of future contribution. Uh, there's always a room for editing the current version, of course, and adding translation of newly updated contents uh, is another issue, such as those on the example page, reference page, and some other project pages. Uh, and it's uh, never too much to emphasize on the importance of translating the current, the consistently updated documentation. Of course, um, translating web editor is another issue. Am Chong, for instance, has started translating the friendly error system in Korean, the friendly error system of the web editor in Korean since last year on, which further addresses the discourses on how to translate in friendly manners. Uh, yeah. So this is all for what I wanted to share today. Uh, those things I wanted to mention more, but yeah, due to time constraint, I'm going to save it for the discussion session. Thank you very much for your attention, and you are more than welcome to ask questions and contact me if you want. Thank you. And I'll pass it back to Kinas. Yeah, thanks very much, Inhua. That was great. So let me introduce our uh, next speaker, who will be uh, Shaharia. So Shahari is a software developer and open source enthusiast from India. He's a contributor to the Hindi translation of the P5JS website and documentation. Shahari's core basic principle is to support people and encourage them to enhance their coding skill. So Shahari, to you. Hello everyone, I am Shahari. So thank you Kenneth for introducing me and let me introduce myself more. I am software developer currently based in India, and I am I right now I am wearing the same T-shirt that I have wear in the poster, and it is of blue color and with white checks, and I have I have glasses and beards all over my face, so you can recognize me over uh, this way. So I am software developer based in India, and also open source contributor at Countly and various other open source project like. Uh, uh, Processing Foundation Metabase. So my introduction with Processing Foundation has been long back uh, in 2015 when the, one of the person told me about Processing Java. That time Java was more famous, Processing Java was more famous and we, I got to know about that time about Processing. And then in my, in the, during my studies in my final year of graduation, I got, I myself was a Processing Fellow to translate the website into Hindi language. So it was a great experience and later I became the mentor for the people who are participating for the process fellowship from India. So let me uh, let me present you with, with my presentation. And to be honest, this will be the great session for you. I hope so. And you will really enjoy this. Okay, so is my... Okay. SSV translation. So why translation is important? It is so it is well known fact whether I am from India, my native language is Hindi. Uh, Inwa is from South Korea, her native language might, might be South Korean. So uh, all the it is well known fact that multilingual people their first thought comes in their native language not in exactly in the english or any other language even we dream we most of the time we dream in our native language so, so connecting uh, studying and connecting with the native language is a lot more easier than connecting connecting with the studies uh, in different other language and according to a static a statistic only 20 percent people in worldwide can speak english and we indian being the non-english speaking country still we are the largest english speaking people in the world after USA, of course. So, but the major problem is that it, still the English penetration is not so uh, deep rooted in India. So, I think the as uh, Kenneth mentioned, the language should never be buried in the learning process. So, uh, even during the colonial rule in India as well, it was a dis matter of discussion what should be the native language or what should be the language of instruction. 
so whether it be english or the local language of india so later on it was decided that based on various studies what uh, what should be the native language and what how the people can relate to studies and excel in their field so coming to the my next slide is this is my slide what exactly we did with p5js then we how we translated it and how how it is looking right now so why coming to the point i am a software engineer and i have translated while working in the country as well i have to work with the translation while working at various organization and uh, companies i have to work on the translation big translation but the translation process in uh, setting up the translation process is not so easy suppose let me take you an example uh, have you uh, the thank you word simple thank you word can you be speaking as dhanyawad in hindi so two word is translated to one word in hindi so it uh, for the design perspective it will take less space and also suppose uh, in the thank you can be translated into something other in arabic but the arabic start from not start from left to right it start from right to left so during the translation process or uh, coding any website it is important that we should never truncate to a string suppose i truncate thank you and you and then translate it it will it will be without any context in arabic language the arabic speaking people or urdu speaking people will not relate to it because for them it should be it should be like uh, in the reverse order so concating a string is not a good ideal solution when we set up the translation environment for any website so if we have good setup then the translation became quite uh, not so quite easy but still it is uh, it 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 should be uh, proper and also but it became easier to translate the website and all website so let's take an okay sorry wait uh, wait a second yeah challenges in the translation so suppose i am uh, i am hindi speaking person if i translate in the korean so might be possible i use google translation or any other platform my uh, that grammar language is not isolated from the grammar the gra grammar should be the perfect so if i translate in korean being a hindi speaking person translating in the korean it will be i can make some blunder mistake and that could lack of the context that proper sentence will not be translated perfectly in the korean and the korean speaking nation people can easily uh, will not able to understand what exactly it is and the they will start suggesting that you should learn english because its recommendation in the english is perfect so whole concept of the translation will fail so translation should be with the proper context inconsistency it is uh, widely discussed by uh, it is widely discussed topic while translation of the website or any other platform that uh, th there should be consistency in the website suppose uh, if uh, suppose a many uh, it is uh, like german german if anyone know german the german uh, german germany lang german language takes more space any word takes more space as compared to any other language or chinese take less less space so if we try if we design the website in a such a manner that uh, uh, after translating it is in the hap hazard manner that it also will not be suitable for reading so suppose i am reading a documentation and the documentation is not designed perfectly designed in any other language in english it is perfect but in, a, in any other language it is not perfect so it can be inconsistent and uh, lead to design and display issue and the formatting issue and also as you may know the any software or any platform is continuously evolving they, daily there might be 100 of a string added there might be one string added or monthly or uh, weekly there might, might be iterations so that uh, each string should be translated continuously for example i i i have also contributed to metabase so what they do is that they have p uh, kenneth asks for the suggestion so it is my suggestion there is one tool po editor i will at the end i will paste the link as well so what they do is that they put all the string over there and send uh, to all the people that are contributed to metabase translation engine so they translate over there and that automatically get integrated to metabase so this way the community they translate using the community they already have suppose pro uh, processing also has a very wide point uh, wide range of 
community. So what we can do is that we can use PO editor and uh, put all the English string over there and people can translate and check it uh, themselves. So the, the continuous process and continuous localization fit, uh, can be somehow deal with PO editor. Okay. So I have already mentioned that uh, there are challenges. Every task has challenges. Even if I'm playing a cricket or football, it comes uh, for fun activity also. Then also there's a challenge that I have to score goal. I have to make runs. So everything has its own challenges. But tackling that challenge is a great achievement for anybody. So I thank Skinit for setting up such a wonderful environment for translations that it is easier to translate the processing as compared to other other tool that I have translated. So uh, it is always uh, important to consider the UI aspect also while setting up the environment for uh, uh, for translations. So that, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, UI should not be distorted due to formatting issue, due to less space taken by the words and everything. So this, uh, uh, this all thing need to be considered while translating and setting up the translation environment. And this, uh, from for this, uh, wait a second. So from this, I want to open the uh, open the podium for the audience so that we can ask the question. And before that, you can check me uh, on Twitter. You will find the uh, I just put anything on Twitter, whether it be poetry, political tweet, and financial tweet, anything. You can find me on GoodHub and Zululu.com. That is my own website. I'm co-founder at this. And I'm, it is a, I'm currently at the beta phase, but open for this session only so that people can join. If they like, give me feedback. So thank you. And uh, any question from me? Uh, I'm sorry if I am very fast. I speak very fast. Yeah, that's all right. So thanks very much. Uh, I think we will move on to the next speaker and then we'll do questions uh, at, at the end there. So for our next speaker is going to be uh, Philippe. Uh, Philippe is a contributor to the uh, Portuguese translation of FIFA.js documentation. He graduated in architecture and urbanism with a master in technology and society in Brazil. He went to Fab Academy on Node at Barcelona in Spain and currently works with digital fabrication for IP installations. So Philippe. Hello, just let me share my screen. Um... Okay, so I think you can see it now. Um, so my name is Felipe. Uh, I will be presenting our case of B5.js translation to Portuguese, actually just the, the reference part, but uh, it was a project backed, backed, backed up by the Processing Foundation through the fellowship program from 2021. I'm Brazilian uh, and located in Curitiba as all, uh, are all our members of our team, except our mentor who is based in Rio de Janeiro. I'm a Caucasian man with full beard and glasses and dark, dark hair, and I'm wearing a blue plaid shirt with a black jacket. And in this, um, in this presentation, I will talk about the context of the project who, we, who we, we are and how we did it. So uh, this slide shows the topics of the presentation. I will talk about our difficulties and how we overcame them and the experience we built and some things we, we learned and we'd like to, to share with the community. It is important to emphasize that I didn't work alone in this project. So um, Caterini, Marcella, and, and Julia worked together with me since the beginning. Uh, they couldn't be here today, but uh, I'm representing them. And we, uh, our group is based at a local maker space called Arocaria Lab, uh, where we meet to make uh, things and do some experience exchange in study groups. We got together in a creative coding group held by the makerspace. And in this slide, we have some pictures of groups and activities, just to have some context. And here are our faces in this slide. 
Uh, Esperança, who, who is the elder man with the classes, he was our mentor in the project. And he's a professor at Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and gave many <laughs> types of classes, I think. Like uh, the, in the program of systems in engineering and computing, he is also a professor in the design graduate program. And Caterini, who is in the left co co corner, uh, the, the in the lower part, she's graduated in law. So I think that everybody has a different context, but we met through the the, this, the creative coding group. And she's also an artist. I think that that's the thing that got us all together. And Marcella, who is in the top left corner, and uh, she's also an, an artist. She uh, also works with um, creative coding as a professional job. So she's really the 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 main person here because she uh, um, uh, she presented P five JS to us, and Julia, who is the the last girl, she's also great uh, an architect. Uh, we met through the, the university, and she's also an artist and is, is working with many things like technology, the coloniality, in cosmopolitics. Um, I'm, I think I, I already did present myself, but I'm, I'm working with the digital fabrication and um, with some creative coding too. So the Creative Coding Night, the collaborative learning club centered on exchange, uh, exchanging knowledge about technology to support our peers in their artistic practices. So during the pandemic, our meetings went online, switching to discussions about personal projects, art pieces, and coding workshops with uh, rotating leadership. In one of these workshops, Marcella presented P5JS to us. And after that, many of us started playing and even uh, eventually working with it. Um, and here in the slide, we, uh, you can see us in our first meeting with Evelyn. So for the fellowship, like um, as Brazilian coders and artists and researchers who have self-taught how to code, we have experienced firsthand the difficulty of in finding educational content in our native language, this Portuguese. And we are part of a small percentage of, Brazilian, of the Brazilian population who have had the, the chance to learn English and therefore are able to access resources that are not available to most of the, the people in our country and other Portuguese speaking ones. So our, propo our proposal for the fellowship program comes from the desire to make P5JS accessible to our community. Um, in this slide, we you can see the, the logo for the project. And we propose to translate the P5JS reference to Portuguese. Uh, and we chose P5 ex uh, exactly because we believe that it, it aligns best with our intended uh, community, the, the Portuguese speaking artists who are interested in using code as part of their work, but they have uh, no or very little experience in, in coding. So our goals initially were uh, translating P5JS reference to and, and the, the, the main parts of the website to Portuguese and uh, a series of short videos in Portuguese containing the uh, presentation of the project, uh, of objective, uh, objectives and community values for, for the P5JS and a brief presentation of selected projects made with P5, which could inspire the Portuguese speaking artist community to use it as a tool in, the, the, in their future projects. And the transcription and compilation of videos content into a friendly PDF file available for free download. So here you can see the, the GitHub of the project that is now really, really organized because we had some difficulties in the, the, the beginning. 
I think that uh, Kenneth also <laughs> helped us a lot with it, with it. So here in Brazil, there are so many foreign terms that we, in, we have incorporated into the language. So especially when it comes to tech or programming, and there were some words that were better to uh, left untranslated. And I think that that's the main uh, topic here within the, the access to translation, because we already got some terms in English to our language that we cannot translate just because it would not work. So to deal with the translation of technical terms, we created a, a translation glossary to like the Korean uh, tra translation project that is available for all future contributors in our GitHub repository. This glossary was developed during weekly meetings with our mentor, that was Claudio Esperanza. And we also faced some gender issues in translation because as in Portuguese, there are many more declinations or types of um, translations that wouldn't work because they're neutral in English. And in, in Portuguese, we have to uh, decide which gender we, we should use, but we, we were careful to try to keep the language as neutral as possible. And when it wasn't possible, we chose to decline it to the feminine. As the tools we used, it, we started like, translating the JSON and the YML files through programming IDEs. And this was, this was also a difficulty in the, the beginning because everyone was working in different ways, in different, different ways. And our GitHub got a little messed up, but we managed to solve this. And in the, I think the, the last weeks of the, the program, Kenneth contacted us to present, present his project with Pontoon. And, and we, realized, we, we realized that uh, the translation process with Pontoon was much faster, where uh, it was more practical and more accessible, actually. So we really like it. And we believe that maybe more people would contribute with translations if they got to get to know Pontum. Um, in the future, we'd like to, actually, I cannot show this video right, right now, but uh, I will explain what it is. Uh, we prioritized the translation, so we didn't get to post the videos that we, we made, but we, pl we plan on posting them um, when they are done, so we can contribute to spread the P5.js in our community. And we already have some content, like you, uh, the video I cannot show right now because the, the PDF um, shows a little intro, the logo of the project. It's a Pesinco, because it's like the, the way we, we call P5.js here in Brazil is like Pesinco. And for the... Um, And the, the community in, in Portuguese language was really uh, receptive about our project. And we were invited to talk about our project in the Processing Team podcast called Noite do Processing from the Garoa Hacker Club that is a makerspace from Sao Paulo. And we had like a, a full conversation of three hours about translation, Processing P5, uh, it was really, really, really nice. I think that uh, you can check it on YouTube, but in Portuguese. <laughs> and after that, we got some of the, of the community to volunteer to translate the examples that we were letting, let, letting to, to translate after the, the reference. And we also received a, a lot of messages about how they were liking the initiative, the initiative, initiative. In, uh, in our Instagram, the people were like, super cool project and we would like to, to participate and was really, really heartwarming for us. And I think that's it.
thanks everyone and especially the the processing foundation who backed up backed us up and the p5js team who were super helpful and kind of the time and you can reach us through these links thank you right thanks very much so thanks for thanks to everyone for their presentation and let us just move on to some discussion. We'll kind of do this and that's more or less a discussion, a, a open discussion. So feel free to chime in and we can even go off topic or from my questions. You know, I just repeat these questions so that we have something to talk about. So kind of the first thing I want to kind of pick your brains on or rather just kind of uh, ask you is like, how do you see the impact of your translation work in your own translation, in your experience. Right? Do you see the translation getting used out there? Do you see people um, using them or do you see people kind of not using them? Or what, how do you see that impact of your work? Uh, yes. Uh, oh, oh, was it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, was I was that? Yeah, go, thank go you. Ahead, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, thanks for the question. Um, for me, it was basically like a um, chaining of shareable experiences and hopefully for others as well. Um, because I had this chance to translate the website, I could use this website as a learning material at workshops and organize workshops myself, um, which made a lot of things easy when it comes to teaching, uh, especially in prepping for the materials and really use it during the workshop. And um, for me, the translation of the website work, this got me uh, be engaged with other contributors' works. For instance, Am Chung's recent work in translating the friendly error system of the web editor. Uh, yeah, or here presenting this, uh, all my experiences here at the Access Day. So this chain of experiences made me also really never forget about the importance of enhancing the lingual accessibility in P5 community and to keep thinking about how to improve a lot of rooms in this, uh, you know, the, uh, the pro probably drawbacks of the current version of the, trans the Korean translated website. And I hope some more people can engage with this chaining experiences, um, which I would like to talk about a little bit more on in some yeah some sometime later during this discussion session yeah you want to chime in uh yes yeah, sure uh you're not unmuted oh i'm extremely sorry for that that no, is all right <laughs> So, uh, if you remember that our processing fellowship part was of mentoring the children. So, when we went to schools, basically primary and middle school, like up to class six, we went to the schools and teach the student about P5 creative coding, what exactly coding is in general, creative coding and everything. So, what I analyzed was that they were able to relate in the Hindi language and also when we provided them with the documentation and the website in the Hindi language, they were more keen to learn about this. Still, I think around uh, one year ago, I also received one of the message from the person that, yeah, this is, the, uh, this is really helpful for him, for his child and anything like that. So, this is, uh, this is the impact that we are creating in India that uh, not only that uh, in Hiva, I think I'm pronouncing your name correct. So she told that 50 plus people in Korea. So in India, it is like uh, less than 15 year or 12 year uh, children more inclined to what our translation process. Yeah, that, that sounds like a really interesting anecdote, right? We one of the important things we really want to do is to access people who may not be traditionally included in the um, traditional tech sense. And also, if you wanted to teach programming and coding to children, well, it's a bit unreasonable to wait for them to learn some English before they can start learning coding and programming. Right? So yeah, that's a very, very good point. Philip, do you want to add something? Actually, I was thinking about the 
some things that we we have in common, like uh, the, the the difficulties of translating, and always about the the English terms that are already present in our language. So that's really really difficult to to uh, get off this, and I I think that also when you were presenting the in, in your presentation I, I i think that like using automatic automatic translations uh, as you said isn't perfect so we always would be needing people to give some context to to correct check and i, I think that i'm going off topic <laughs> from your question but that's the the, the only thing that i was thinking about in, you know of the presentations today and uh, i don't know just to extend the, the the talk a little yeah all right thank thanks very much so we're kind of a bit short on time so let me just uh jump ahead a bit so the next thing i want to kind of just start exploring is what would a steward and maintenance system for p5 translate translation look like um, where can we start looking? What should we start thinking about? And um, yeah, any, any insights? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Yes. So basically, uh, uh, I have seen the Metabase. Have you heard about Metabase? Is an open source pro, uh, analytics tool, business analytics tool. So what they do is that they have the uh, uh, all the spring on POA editor. I, if I can, uh, I share the link as well. So they put all the string on PO editor and bombard the mail to all the contributors and everyone who have subscribed to their newsletter or anything translation related thing that they bombard the message and people start translating on their own. So this community driven uh, maintenance and localization will be more efficient. Suppose if I am not available, if anyone is not available, then any other from person from India, because in India also there is large processing community. In Korea, likewise, in Brazil, likewise. So if uh, in China, likewise. So, so uh, the people community-based translation will be more efficient and also people can ch uh, change their... Uh, people who don't know GitHub also can also contribute over there. Yeah, it sounds like a kind of one of the way we can explore this kind of distributed um, contribution. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I'm just sharing the link of that if you want to. Yes, explore, please please. Do, yeah. yeah. I just ping in the message chat. I think the, the tools that we use can be. Uh, can be more um, useful or, or more, I don't know how to say it, like we, we don't have the, the tools to translate, like we don't, do not have something like really specific to it. So when you, trans, uh, you presented the Pontoon project for us was the first uh, tool that we really uh, thought like, this is it. This should be some some uh, the, the the main mainly way that we are translating things, or we should I don't know seek for other tools or having a, a tool just for it. So I think that this is one of the difficulties right now too. Yeah. Uh, can I add one thing? Yes, please. So, yeah. So I think uh, for the for maintaining and bringing more contributors in for for the translation is um, I think one of the most important thing about it is to have a group of steward with different backgrounds. Um, I started translating this website back in the days when I wasn't familiar with programming or graphics myself, or even to know how to use GitHub. But I could go through this process with the help of a lot of resources that's already on the GitHub, on the website, and people from the Processing Foundation. And I also believe that this the translation of P5.js isn't just um, isn't just about technological translation, but it's more like tech cultural translation. 
So for instance, this work of translation includes translating the spirit and values of PIPA.js, the attitudes towards diversity and the, um, you know, the friendly attitudes in general. These are all these values that should be translated, not just from a technology perspective, but people, for, people from you know, diverse backgrounds can add on more translation onto. And yeah, and also this jargon was one of the issues I have been always keeping in mind. This translating of jargons in Korean has a lot of issues as well because people use different, um, even if they are, you know, be, be them experts or not, they have different understanding of uh, jargons because basically all these jargons are translated directly from English in most of the cases. For instance, you know, library, the term library is used library in Korean. So yeah, all these issues can be reviewed from people from different backgrounds. That would be really useful. And in terms of promoting the diversity and inclusion. Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much. That's a really good point. So uh, we're kind of running towards the end, but I want to just squeeze in one more question for you all, or like kind of just a short question. What advice would you give someone interested in translating P5JS? That's the one advice you would give me. One advice in the sense like uh, translating with processing or setting up the translating environment for any other project as well. Um, I think a bit of both, I guess. I think a bit of both would be useful. Okay, so my basic thing is that I don't translate without knowing the context of the thing because that can uh, more like it will it, it uh, always anything helps but it will create a more nuisance like uh, it will be less meaningless so it will not mean anything so understand the context then translate it uh, i remember when i was also translating the things then one of our, one of our fellow translated one of the uh, part without understanding total of the context and later on we realized that this this, uh, this in Hindi does not mean anything. So it was like gibberish like thing. So we retranslated it, reiterated the things, then it makes sense. So translating and translating with the context are two different things. So always translate with understanding the context and what exactly you we want to convey over there. So it is always good to have that perspective while translating. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, so to tell from a person who wants to bring more contributors uh, in the field of translation, I just wanted to say that just starting off is really an important first step. And as I have uh, listed up on the very last page of my slide today, uh, there are just tones of things you can start with directly. And yeah, um, and there are, uh, other than me, there are a lot of uh, Korean translation contributors so far. For instance, there was uh, Joseph Hong from last year's Google Summer of Code. And uh, there's Am Chung, whom I mentioned that she is translating the friendly error system uh, as a creator of the system herself. And also there's Soon Lee, So Sun Park, the, uh, the translators of documentation contributors docs and um, creators of video tutorials. There's just so many uh, people out there who, are, who have done this before and are willing to help you out, starting how to do with this. And like I've mentioned, I started the translation um, even without the knowledge of using GitHub. And um, yeah, there, there's a really a very kind, kind guideline of how to start contributing on GitHub. So don't get scared. <laughs> just feel free to uh, reach anyone interested. Oh yeah, I will, I will share the slides right after, yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, Philippe, do you want to add something? Uh, I think that bringing a, a team with different cultural backgrounds, which uh, can help in the trans translation, checking and contact on contexting, I think that's really important because here in Brazil, the, the country is really big. So the way we talk in the South is really different from the North. And we have to, to, to talk about it. Like uh, we, we have some people from the community that are, that are from the North and they are really like, well, 
in our context, this really uh, doesn't work. So we had to re <laughs> retranslate some, some parts. And I think that entering and, and looking for a community to talk about the translation is also important because when we started this project, we went after like if people were already doing it or something like that. And we found out that the reference from uh, the processing software is where it was already being done, being, uh, in, it, being translated. So it really started, uh, it really helped us because we, we got in contact with the, the, the team which was translating and we talked about the, the terms that like, should we translate um, English terms? Should we use the feminine de decline, uh, decline and things like that? Were, so it was super important for us. Yeah, thanks very much. So um, yeah, I think I'll try to close here. We're kind of a bit over time, but thanks very much for all of you to kind of take the time. Um, and I hope to kind of see you around online or anywhere else. So I'm going to hand it back to Q and thanks very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for the great panel. Uh, Ken, uh, Yuwa, uh, Shaharia and uh, Felipe. Access is, uh, sorry, translation is just such an area that's so close to me. Uh, I really hope we will continue this discussion uh, in, in the future.